a big hello and a grand welcome uh, to this uh, most fascinating debate of the day organized by Horasis. And uh, I'm very privileged to have with me some of the most distinguished panels, some of the, the influential voices of different parts of the country to debate on a topic that interest all of us, which to my mind are getting uh, neglected. Hopefully we'll be able to raise uh, some of uh, the key areas of concerns, the challenges as well as the opportunities, what we're going to see. Uh, my name is Satya Brahma and I'm your moderator. I run a media company in India and it also spreads out to the various other countries because I have a do online presence. And uh, uh, I have spent around uh, 15 years of life covering the nook and corner of the country as well as the world trying to find out the voices and I've practically been to remote remotest villages and finding out what the situation are there actually. Uh, but nevertheless, I'll be able to start the discussion. So uh, very fantastic discussion. Uh, the topic of today's discussion is developing administrative capacities in the rural enclaves. And I'm um, having privilege with me is uh, Solomon Darwin, who's the executive director uh, of, uh, you know, the Gavard Center of Corporate Innovations and is also in, uh, hailed as the father of the Smart Villages movement. Very fantastic to have you with you, sir. Well, uh, Darwin has board leadership experience in corporate management and academia. He's an international speaker recognized by peers, executives and students with numerous awards for his innovative leadership and passion for teaching that he inspires students for both the business as well as from the engineering disciplines. In his courses for open innovations, business models, smart cities, Scalable Smart Villages, IBM Watson, and Business Models for Emerging Economics. Uh, Solomon is an expert in open innovations and open business model, and he is an advisor to the senior executives of the MSCs and the government leaders in the emerging world. That's a very good way to look at. Uh, the list includes Google, and NSP, the, you know, the uh, and j and Toyota, NSK, and so many other uh, companies which are to recommend. And he also directs and moderates international innovations, conferences and forums and chairs quarterly uh, chief innovation officers roundtables in Silicon Valley. Uh, but I am the moderator today, so I think uh, you'll have to give me the privilege of moderating. Uh, prior to joining uh, Barclay, actually, you know, in 2005, he was uh, associate professor for nine years uh, at the University of Southern California. His progressive corporate leadership experience covers the span of around 14 years as a senior executive officer in the Bank of U.S., first uh, interstate branch at Glenet Federal Bank uh, and Motorola. During the summers, Darwin regularly teaches an exclusive program at uh, prominent international universities and international institutions. He has conducted workshops and programs in over 18 countries. That's quite incredible. He also, uh, you know, serves as honorary professor at several universities in Europe, China, and India. And his current project, Building Scalable Smart Villages, was commissioned by the government of India. Very welcome to have you with you, Mr. Darwin, on the panel. Thank you. Uh, next, our next speaker is Deepak uh, uh, Gaiwani. He's the former minister of water resources in Nepal. One of the biggest voices in Nepal who has stood with the testing times. And uh, during the times of uh, Indo-Nepal borders, which I've covered extensively, very, uh, very fantastic uh, you know, the relationship India has maintained. Uh, but over the last two to three months, uh, the geographical, uh, geopolitical, uh, you know, the, uh, dis uh, the debate has escalated to the triangle. But that I will come back to the later on. Deepak actually is a hydraulic power engineer and a political economist uh, who during his time as Nepal's Minister of Water Resources in 2002 and three initiated uh, various reforms in the electricity and irrigation sector focused on decentralization and promotion of rural participation in governance. He also initiated the first national review and uh, companion of ne national laws in Nepal, is, in Nepal and guidelines with the World Commission of uh, uh, Dams. Uh, Mr. Gauni has been a visiting professor at the UN University in Japan, as well as a research scholar at the East West Center in Hawaii, the Queen Elizabeth House in Oxford, the London School of Economics, and the International Environment Academy in Switzerland. And his research focuses on the interface between the technology society as related to energy issues. He has a long profile to go, but I will cut it over here. He's one of the very stalwart uh, with us and a very privileged to have you with you, sir, actually. Next, our next speaker is also one of the most powerful voice in, in, in the energy sector. is none other than Adwiti Jose. is the chief executive officer of Clean Energy Access Network in India. Adwit is actually a CEO of Clean uh, Clear Energy Access Network. It's a non-profit network of 220 plus clean energy organization 
which is committed to support unify grow and impact even clean energy enterprises in india and clean is considered as the industry body for decentralized renewable renewable energy that is dre sector of the country at clean adwits prime focus is on rural and underprivileged communities where reliable and affordable and clean energy plays a unique role in accelerating social environmental and economic development clean also has remarkably you know contributed to the development and influencing uh, the public policies for the sector bridge the access to finances for clean energy startups and facilitated technology innovations assisted its members in expanding the market research and build capacity of clean energy enterprises and prior to clean adwit was associate director of samita social ventures and i know about that it is a leading csr consulting firm and a nitin engineering by graduate who started his career with co-founding a, a rural centric best to energy startup which grew to a 200000 rupee dollar revenue in its first 3 years that's quite remarkable adwit actually and very pleased to have with you to share your very you know insightful thoughts in today's debate what we're discussing discussing about the administrative capacity in rural enclaves thank you so much well our uh, next speaker is carlos uh, is the founder of monsoon spain an academic and director of bachelor in computer science and artificial intelligence is a bachelor of information in uh, systemic management i school of uh, human science and technology Charles actually currently is the director in IE University School of Human Sciences and Technology where he leads the bachelor's program in information system management and computer system uh, artificial intelligence prior to joining IE actually Charles spent around a decade in building two of the most global technology startups that is actually Sun for I then the Monsuit Innovation that use artificial intelligence and data science to build platforms for developing corporate innovation something is, which is very important in the rural transformation i think in next course of the discussion we'll be discussing how we can have artificial intelligence in the rural governance system of china in his role for the founder and chief scientist he led the development of uh, you know algorithmics urban service architecture and ai platforms around innovation ecosystem creating the first new innovation electronic connecting to industries his work has been recognized in several international forums before entering the world of technology startups Charles enjoyed a 20 years of career in consulting, and he served as a director, partner, and senior consulting at top government uh, you know, institutions like KPMG, then PwC, then various Deloitte, and so many other institutions. Charles has been adjacent to Professor of IE at IE Business, CEU Business School, and that the Catholic Ellipson School of Business and Economics. Charles holds an MBA from IE Business School, a certified international strategist. from london business school a certificate of investment and finance in sustainability sustainability in harvard university and as a bachelor in law in university of compulsory that's uh, he is also the phd candidate at the telecom institute engineering after the polytechnic university of moral research and university of system very pleased to have you with you sir well our next uh, speaker is dhananjay mule uh, is one of the most known figure uh, is a decorated uh, you know ir sophia sir He spent uh, uh, nearly uh, 36 years uh, in his various assignments in the Indian Foreign Service. Mr. Mulla is now engaged in many grassroots activities at village, block, and district level, with two prolonged objectives: preparing food-prone villages for the you know, inevitable flood every year through a bit better preparedness. That's quite important because the floods keep coming to India, and we need to be better prepared actually. And Mr. Mulla hopefully is giving the right directions to the government and the NGO that is coming. Uh, training and supply of equipment. The second side of his, you know, he's trying to bring self-reliance to these villages by improving agricultural food and leading markets easily, providing training to various skills and creating jobs and improving health and education facilities. And all this happens in close cooperation with the civil administration and local political leaders. Besides, he has also begun a movement which is called the Positivity to bring holistic transformation on the basis of creativity and innovations. and constructive approach to issues of social political and economic justice and aligned to a large number of organization for this cause all initiatives are non uh, political and of non business in nature urbanization pattern and prospects and management of urban development and services uh, this is uh, the profile of the you know the distinguished panels which you have about the next uh, 35 to you know 30, uh, 30, 40 minutes we are going to debate about uh, the evolution of the rural transformation of india and i would like to thank the organizers uh, and i would like to thank uh, horasis global uh, seminars 
and especially Frank for bringing all of us together from the different platforms. We are conducting this uh, debate at a time when the world is witnessing a terrible crisis unprecedented in the history of the world, which we never faced, that is the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, this is this has actually, you know, devastated the world. The escalating tension and uh, trade between China and the U.S. And there is a lot of divide between the train, um, trade and commerce with the various countries are taking a toll. We are hosting this debate at a time when we don't know what the future is going to be. We are also hosting a debate at a time which is, which is interesting to us because all of us, despite knowing the problem for where today, we are connected digitally. And we are actually openly discussing about it. That gives us a ray of hope that how we could find out an amicable solution for this COVID-19 pandemic. Although it's not a subject to discuss, but it has got a reg, uh, it has got a it has got its own relevance in the present context. Because even if you discuss about uh, the rural issues, even if you're going to discuss about developing administrative capacity in rural enclaves, there's a strong bearing from the COVID-19 pandemic. Coming to uh, Solomon Darwin first. If I could ask you, how do you look at the present structure of the urban and uh, the rural compositions? Uh, what is that? What is what are the hopes that you give it to you? Give it to the present structure, actually, Mr. Darwin. Well, please. you know, uh, that's a very good question. I think we are in, living in interesting times. Uh, it's a wake-up call for all of us that we cannot forget the rural infrastructure that feeds all of us. You could be sitting in a high rise, a hundredth, uh, hundredth floor, but the food has to come to you from villages. And the rural villages, I think that infrastructure has been neglected for a long time. We are very much into empowering uh, with the digital technology, the, the young people in cities, but I think the farmers, the people in rural areas need to be empowered. It, they don't need the physical um, infrastructure. They need more access to markets. They need access to tools. They need to access to education. They don't need to go and live in uh, slums and uh, else, elsewhere. They can be where they are and learn coding, learn programming, and uh, sell things and provide services throughout the world globally because the world today is digital. Digital infrastructure that is mobile, it's very cost effective, it is affordable, it's accessible. Today we can do that. And I think our focus should more be on how do you empower people, where almost 70% of the people who live in India in rural areas, you know, we need to focus on that. And I think we are talking about a lot of people that who can add a lot of value to the world if you give them access, tools, education, resources, because we don't really need a physical infrastructure. So the at Berkeley, we started a movement called Smart Village Movement. Yes. And that is all about building people, not building infrastructure. It's giving them access to tools and uh, platforms where they can sell, eliminating all the middlemen. You know, so when you give people that kind of power through digital technology, you know, that's what's most important. Uh, you know, I think that's uh, what I would say as my introductory statement. Would you like to uh, share the screen uh, with the pictures that you have, you know, yes. which could be beneficial for our viewers to know? Because these are yes. the interesting slides which could be a lot of relevance. Yes, let me see if I can uh, share the screen here. And um, um, uh, yes, let's see. Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, not yet, not yet, if you could try. How about now? No, we're not able to see. Okay, let's see. Um, let's see, I think I need to... Uh, yeah, can you see it now? Uh, not yet. I think uh, we let me let me do this. Uh, oh, here it is. Yeah, I 
All right. Yes, we can see it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, you know, when Bill Gates came to India a couple of years ago, one of his major concern is why are the farmers committing so uh, suicide, and why aren't the farmers prospering? So we, as Berkeley, we did study of ten thousand farmers, especially in Andhra, because that's when where I'm working. The reason that the farmers are dying is because. in everyone tries to he becomes a debtor to the seed company the fertilizer company the landlord you know the uh, pesticide company so he doesn't have any hope after a while so we felt in the crop cycle if everyone is extracting from the farmer uh we need to reverse the curve and create an s curve like this where all the companies involved in the growth cycle they work together as an ecosystem rather than to work separately and extract from the farm so this is an ecosystem approach which means based on the study it eliminates costs completely from the system so costs are saved it benefits everyone time is saved speed to market risk is also shared equally among all companies rather than the farmer bearing all the risk there's an improvement in yield because if the farmer lives they all live there's also the farmer happiness and also data richness if we can have platforms that can collect good data that data becomes very valuable to improve uh, the entire system so this is uh, the last slide i'm going to share with you so that you would know what i'm talking about uh when we talk about creating smart villages you can see this green hexagonal diagram on the side you can see all those companies that are working with us with berkeley uh in the center we have energy and the connectivity we're working with uh, anel we are also working with reliance now um so if you don't have energy and connectivity you cannot have a good village infrastructure so that yes. brings in all the other companies that you're saying you know hero cycles and rural transportation take mahendra from farming right and uh, healthcare you have apollo hospitals dr reddy and uh, educational systems salesforce uh, nvidia microsoft amazon they're all offering online programs for kids to learn sitting in villages learning programming learning coding testing them certifying them and placing them in jobs <laughs> and then water and sanitation and safety so that green hexagonal diagram is all about creating an ecosystem that addresses holistically all the issues that a person sitting in a village it will will need from care and this side here the brown one is all about how the farmer really can access markets and you have one to six there and this is the, the approach that uh, berkeley is using and i think we can probably use this as a guide if you have any more questions as to what i do uh in india on smart villages and infrastructure and so i think that's where i would uh, probably all stop right, fantastic all right fantastic now let me move to mr deepak uh, uh, who is the former minister of nepal uh, welcome to your habit us sir actually and in fact uh, you can see on the screen uh many of uh, the people are also you know talking about it you can also uh, you know give the reply if you wish to uh, mr deepak uh, you are one of the stalwarts uh, in the global sector and a former minister of nepal and presently also very active in uh, the today's nepal uh, government system what is the fundamental difference you are seeing in the nepal's uh, rural ecosystem with the india's ecosystem okay uh, thank you satya thank you and uh, to all my panelists uh i'm going to talk about three you you hit the nail on the head uh, there's a significant difference between nepal and india or bangladesh or pakistan or any other country and uh, there are three things that are significant you know and this is what i've got to tell you one is that uh, because nepal had not been a colony and there are very few countries that really avoided colonization uh like nepal thailand japan uh the implication of this for rural or whatever other development is that uh, our traditional institutional basis was intact it had not been wiped out by you know destroyed by colonialism 
And as a result, Nepal has been more successful in experimenting with institutional uh, innovations like community forestry, uh, community water supply, uh, and in uh, the case that I initiated as a minister, com- uh, rural, uh, community rural uh, communitization of electricity, as we call it. You know, the, uh, the, the, this is extremely important to realize because what we are talking about is not uh, top-down development of, uh, you know, things, plans coming from the center, you know, right down through the blo- district to collector sahab and, um, you know, <laughs> all these other magistrates and all that. What we're talking about is actually allowing villagers the autonomy, uh, more in the sense of what we choose to call here in Nepal, Gandhi and Maoism. You know, oh both God. of which are forgotten by both China and India. Let's be very clear about it. Gandhi has been, you know, the last Gandhi, I believe, was Vinoba Bhave and uh, Jipakas Narayan. Uh, nobody else since then. And in, in Mao's case, after Mao, there's been no Maoism in China either, which is essentially about providing, uh, giving, uh, allowing the villagers the right to self-organize. Okay? Not top-down top down gifted Nepal, development. Nepal has gone softer on China nowadays, actually. Oh, no, 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 no. It's India which pushed. This is a long story. Let's not get into that oh, now. No, 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 but it started in 2005, pushing yeah. Nepal towards China with India's 12-point Delhi deal in 2005. I don't want to get into that right now because it's a subject matter for a whole big debate. Like, yeah. But essentially what uh, we are talking about in rural development is allowing villagers to take advantage of the market rather than the market taking advantage of the villagers which is what we are seeing right now in Nepal, India with COVID, which was it took COVID for urban and elite India and Nepal to realize that we have a huge informal economy and we have our villagers who are serving in, you know, in Kathmandu or Delhi or Bombay as uh, informal laborers. Okay, And uh, they were completely out of sight, out of mind, you know, and uh, their plight is so terrible. I am really scared as a political analyst the implication of this is going to be felt in the coming, you know, I don't know, five, ten years in, in the polity of both India, Nepal and other places. Uh, the anger of the average Nepali informal worker who had to walk back to his village from Kathmandu to West Nepal and from Delhi to Bihar. I mean, you talk to their families, they have families over here also. And the anger is so much, you know, that they say that they're not going to trust the center anymore. Okay. So this is the first uh, basic point I need to make. The other one is that um, I come from a tradition, it's called, some theory, it's called, I mean, it's a long explanation. But essentially what we argue is that urban and rural are extremely misleading concepts. What we use is a term called Desakota. It was popularized by East West Central Hawaii researchers um, uh, and came across them in my Berkeley days, by the way. <laughs> So what Desa Kota, it comes from Bhasha Indonesia term, is from Sanskrit. Desa means rural and Kota is town, like Kotwal, you know, the, the, the pattern wielding policeman in the, in the city center. But Desa Kota means neither rural nor urban. So what we have cases in Nepal and India, we've done enough studies on this in India and Nepal and China and Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. It shows that in any place, like you go to a village in Nepal, which takes three days walking from the nearest roadhead, and you say, yeah, of course, it's rural, right? Okay. But then if you look at the income basket of a household there, you'll find out that only 40% of the income comes from rural sources. Very true. 60% of the income can come all the way from London or Tokyo or God knows where. Or the <laughs> Gulf or somewhere. Okay. So is that family rural or urban? In one way, you'd say, yeah, rural, you know, because it's in the middle of nowhere. We're you know, surrounded by forests and things like that. But on the other hand, it's only 40% rural and 60% uh, uh, b- b- urban. Okay. And uh, finally, the, 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 the third point that I'm making is that, uh, you know, uh, from my work in uh, rural empowerment since the early 90s, uh, what we discovered is that this whole microcredit thing is gone off track, frankly, to tell you. But we used... The term microcredit was not even popular then. We used microcredit only as a tool. Microcredit was not an end in itself. It was a means to allow empowerment, but only after the landless in the village self-organized. You know, and the first loan I remember that my organization gave was just you know fifteen thousand rupees to a bunch of uh, blacksmiths in Nepal. Blacksmiths are untouchables, okay, and uh, they were able to use that fifteen thousand rupees in a family of twenty-seven to actually buy copper plates 
and not have to take loan from the village, uh, uh, you know, um, landlord. Okay, and make religious items. You know, these copper items for religious pujas. Uh, they have the skills. Ten years later, these landless were able to buy. They had already bought land. Now, so this is the uh, the thing that uh, we like to talk about. And I could talk about you know the, the community electricity and community water supply that really empowered the management. Come to the next level. I'll pass, I'll pass for that now and come back later. Yeah. Uh, before I let you go, Deepak, uh, I wanted to ask a, a very a question which is not relevant to the debate. Are you planning to come back to politics and uh, becoming a minister again? Oh, I am always in politics. I don't do party politics. I don't believe in party politics like the famous there French intellectual. There is a speculation in the media that you might uh, even contest the elections next time. Actually, I, I don't believe in party politics at all. I believe in issue-based politics. So I've been in the politics of uh, Ag or Pani, you know, water and energy for the last forty years, and I continue to do my politics of water and energy, of what good development in water and energy are. But I, mean, I work with the cross spectrum. I mean, coming I to the power again. Huh? Well. I'm, I'm, in a sense, I am in power. I am one of the biggest critics here. <laughs> People <laughs> listen to me, they like me, like me or not. More often, they don't like me, but they have that to was, listen. I work very, across the political spectrum, by the way. Very, I work very, across the spectrum from left to right. That was a very insightful thought uh, from Deepak, who spoke extensively about how the rural-urban uh, divide is all about and how the distress the rural people are facing. Now, coming to our next speaker is is actually Advait Joshi. Who is actually championing the you know the energy solutions uh, in the country in his uh, movement called he's the CEO of the Clean. Uh, Thanks. Be, Thanks, Satya. Ad, hi, hi. Advit, uh, very privileged to have you. Could you please throw some light in the context of today's debate about uh, you know administrative capacity in the rural enclaves? How the energy sector could play an important re- role in the rural development and how could it benefit, especially in those areas? where the people are not getting the basic electricity and uh, that has been the subject of a very good topic in, in the present Modi government as well. If you could throw some light. Oh, we can't hear you. Yes, we can't hear. We can't hear you. I think we need uh, a microphone. Okay. Uh, am I audible now? Yes, yes, very much. Yeah. Sorry, I wasn't mute. So uh, let me take a step back and uh, first try to understand, you know, why rural residents need to leave their homes and, you know, move to city to work, right? We city dwellers, if I have to call ourselves, we have access to jobs, income, healthcare, education, most of our other social requirements uh, at our convenience or in today's age of technology, almost at our fingertips. So the whole for me, I think the only way that we can build, uh, you know, rural enclaves better, uh, you know, in their capacity is how can we make villages smart and convenient? Uh, so I've completely aligned with what uh, Solomon Darwinji said, uh, what uh, you know Deepati said, completely aligned with that. Unfortunately, uh, even in the current state, if I think about it in the COVID-19 uh, times, people from rural communities are the ones who are facing double brunt, uh, not just because of the pandemic, also because of the climate change. Um, so for example, as soon as the lockdown uh, was announced, uh, they were forced to travel back to their homes. They sort of lost their daily uh, incomes. They lost the benefit of having access to good health infrastructure in cities. Similarly, uh, as they went back home, uh, they are left with very little resources to survive. Now, as soon as the lockdown is opening up, uh, you will see that you know many of them will again be forced to move back to cities to look for jobs and you know other basic amenities. So at Clean, with our uh, network of uh, decentralized renewable energy champions or enterprises, we believe that sustainable decentralized renewable energy can actually democratize this process. So what it means is that if I am living in these rural enclaves or further remote areas, uh, you know, in India, uh, I will have access to better <laughs> healthcare, better education, a job which is close to my house, which is uh, giving me enough income. If I have access to reliable energy, that is where you know we work uh, in this uh, in this space. Uh, in a village with reliable energy or sustainable energy, it creates a level playing field for uh, rural communities or citizen, rural citizens uh, to compete with people like us. Uh, clean members quite a few times have demonstrated this that even a small farmer, if has is empowered by renewable energy, which typically is not available in uh, rural areas, 
uh, can increase their income uh, or double their income. So, for example, uh, one of our uh, clean members works in Gumla, which is about you know 90 kilometers from Ranchi, and uh, there they have set up a solar mini grid. Because of that mini grid, uh, the local farmers over there who have been traditionally growing mustard seeds and selling the mustard seeds in the markets are uh, were able to invest and see that opportunity in an oil expeller. The oil, mustard oil that is uh, generated out of it through market linkages support are now actually being delivered in most of the larger cities in and around uh, Ranchi. So that has helped this farmer to actually move from a 10 to 15,000 per month of income to close to 60 to 70,000 per month of income. That's more than double of you know the farmer farming income. I would just to interrupt you, if you could tell me, yeah. uh, the business model, uh, the revenue model which you talked about, in, this is actually investment of money actually. You no, not it. really. Not really. There are many different models that uh, are... Public, uh, the point uh, which I'm asking, is it a public-private partnership which you're working? Uh, so it is. A, some of them are public-private partnerships. Some of them are completely private setups uh, working with local village level entrepreneurs and they provide uh, such so, so, uh, energy services and products to communities. Uh, Similarly, we have seen that many of our members have been able to demonstrate at the healthcare level as well. Right. So currently in India, about 200 million people in the rural areas are poorly served uh, due to lack of electricity at primary healthcare centers and sub-centers. That's about 26% of sub-centers not having access to you know, uh, reliable power. Now, many of our members have actually showcased that you know, if you know, a, a small... Uh, clean energy project can be set up, be it solar, be it biogas, be it you know hydro or uh, pico hydros in hilly terrains or even wind. Uh, this energy for healthcare can actually upgrade the health systems to not just give basics like you know, lights and fans, but to actually also give them baby warmers, give them you know solar powered dental healthcare, to even telemedicine, which actually enables uh, you know healthcare workers to give door to door service which today we are privileged to and not at the rural communities. And all of this can actually happen with something as small as 0.6% of the budgets that is available with energy and health in today's budget for India. That's the kind of leap that we can take. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, we have seen that you know, uh, out of the 34 million rural micro entrepreneurs out there, enterprises out there, 14% have come back and said that lack of reliable energy has been a challenge. So putting back this everything into perspective, uh, I think the big divide for us is the fact that you know we are not able to provide rural enclaves and administration uh, this kind of energy which can act like a catalyzer uh, to build resilient communities. That's a very good uh, pointer actually, uh, Mr. Josi. If I could uh, move into Carlos. Carlos, are you there? Carlos, are you there? I, we don't see him there yet. So. Yeah, we don't see Carlos over there. Anyway, uh, now let me let me go back to uh, you know the uh, Solomon, which you initially spoken about uh, you know the the smart city model, and in fact you also dwelt about uh, the farmers' conditions there in the rural areas. Could you please speak something about the healthcare reforms that needs to be done? for the rural sector that that is actually a vital point because as you rightly told 70 percent of indians do re, uh, live in villages so what about these uh, you know the the healthcare sector uh, which is to my mind is neglected because the doctor's patient's ratio is very it's widening and uh, this is a difficult area to debate on if you could throw some light solomon it will be very yes, best. I think the healthcare again. Um, uh, thank God for this uh, COVID nineteen in a way because uh, it is uh, even in the now United anyone, States. Before you could can start, you before you could start, let me tell you now. Anyone can enter and participate in the debate. Yes, please go on. Sure. Sir. You know this uh, COVID nineteen. Even in the United States now, everyone is into telemedicine because it's it's one of those things that's catching fire. And even in villages, I ran a hospital uh, in India. Telemedicine was a failure, but now I think uh, it is time for people to really think that there's a lot of power in the telemedicine and the capabilities of telemedicine. And I think it's digital infrastructure is cheap. It's vast. You can get, uh, I think the current um, program that uh, Prime Minister Modi has is a great program. Uh, it uh, addresses the needs of the 40% 
uh, of the population that are poor. But one thing that, but there are also abuses in that one. But what I would say is, if a person, you know, with all the healthcare models that we worked with in villages, once a person has awareness about what he has, what are the risks, he takes care of his health. The problem is that he doesn't know what he has. And so we took one village and we digitalized all the health records and put it into the cloud. So I think so that information is accessible by any doctor in anywhere in the world to help that person. So the best way to break the existing infrastructure and help these people is to, if they, I think uh, Prime Minister Modi's program is a great program. Uh, I think if we can add one more thing to it, which is if you get regular checkups, you qualify for this program, that regular checkups on every six months or every year, I think once the patient becomes aware about what he has, the risk he has, he will take care. He's incentivized to take care of his health, and it will be a great program. I think that's that's my little two cents, and we can use all the digital tools that we have uh, to help these people. That's my um, little spiel on it. Uh, Deepak ji, yes, please go on. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, um, I was going to add to this. One of the things that COVID showed is... <laughs> There is no health care in the villages. And we did not use the lockdown time to yeah. strengthen health post, elementary health post. Okay? Fully agree. I fully agree with you. We did, we did none of that. And uh, uh, the basic, there's a philosophical question that we as a society have to uh, answer. Nepal, India and elsewhere, okay, in the global south. Is health a private good or a public good? Welcome back, Carlos. Actually, you've come in, yes. Is health a private good or a public good? If you ask me, it mostly should be a public good with private at some of these fancy levels, okay? And uh, the second point is, you know, COVID, you know, it's a single hegemonic solution that we suggested, A, lockdown, and B, wash your hands for 20 seconds, 20 times a day, okay? So we, we, we have cases, uh, Bombay's Dharavi, for instance, they don't have more than six liters per capita per day water. How are you going to wash your hands for 20 seconds, 20 times a day, okay? So the, these hegemonic kind of uh, solutions don't work. So if providing safe water alone in villages, you know, would have gotten, you know, 70% of our health problems are from bad water. Okay? And that would have been solved. So as a society now, we are being forced to go back to this idea that health is a public good. And we have to concentrate on providing public good. Yeah, with that note, let me take to Carlos over there. Uh, Carlos, you are an academician and uh, a very powerful boys in terms of uh, your teaching faculty if you could talk something about the use of artificial intelligence uh, and uh, the big data analytics in the rural transformation are you able to hear me carlos are you able to hear me i i, I don't think so uh, yeah i don't think carlos is there carlos, are you are you with us it's not visible yeah, I think we have Muleji with us. Sure Muleji. Yes, Muleji, you are there? Yeah, yeah. Yes, Muleji, yes. Can you please talk about uh, the artificial intelligence on the, you know, uh, the rural uh, uh, reforms that we're talking about? How artificial intelligence and big data are going to play a crucial role in the formation of a most powerful and a robust, uh, you know, the village uh, a system, urban centric system that you're going to witness? Well, uh, let me uh, confess that I'm a believer in natural intelligence than in artificial intelligence. I also, <laughs> feel, I, I really feel that, I really feel that I am much uh, rooted uh, in terms of being able to see the real problems at the ground level. We are still far away. Uh, I'm not saying it's not being entirely not being implemented or not being practiced. Well, everybody has a smartphone and to that extent, I know everybody is on the AI, I would say. But the question is their problems are not necessarily always technological. These are issues which are very human, human issues. Well, where I come from, I, I'm trying to, you know, do it in three different ways. One is really at a micro level, I have adopted two villages and trying to see if I can actually, through a holistic interventions, try and improve the complete 360, bring some 360 degree improvement in those villages. 
so it's it covers everything but to begin with it covers flood management or disaster management because these two villages i have chosen are the most vulnerable ones where every year the floods would be coming and the villagers are every year unprepared so to say so the action starts only when the water almost touches the village and then there is a panic uh, everywhere and district administration doesn't have to deal with only two villages alone there are many such uh, villages so you know trying to prepare because that, that has an impact on everything that they do in the rest of the year because the crop is gone the houses uh, are destroyed you know in a sense the fields are all inundated with water the standing crops are destroyed so you know that is one area i am working and in these two villages we have taken uh, i would say interventions which really cover 360 degree whether it is education uh, mr uh, mr mudai got it now let me let me ask you a very vital question yes uh, you have been working with the flood affected areas for so many years and you have been quite successful in giving out a clear cut directions on what could be the road ahead but why repeatedly the governments after governments are failing i am talking in the context of maharashtra where you know the government doesn't seem to be prepared when the flood comes in you know the water logging happens and you know the general lives are paralyzed who is responsible for this am i to blame the government or am i to blame the public or am i to blame the public uh, uh, am i to blame the policy makers well here once again you have to address what's happening at the you know basic level we have failed in bringing out a model of development that is eco friendly both to villages and am urban area am i to understand that india as a nation am i to understand that india as a nation has failed to cope up with the rise of the floods that has been coming the states of the well, states are complaining but there are no clear cut directions and vision actually well it's a i think very uh, general statement what i am trying to say is the the whole uh, development model is very much based on the western model you know consume maximum produce maximum sell maximum earn maximum live maximum that's not necessarily uh, going to help us and it's very important to know where to use technology where not to use technology where to bring human solutions and you know i really always drive my attention to the constitution of india and social economic and political justice can we really focus uh, through that and bring those justices to both urban and rural poor that is a question that constantly bugs me up that's why i'm focusing on villages and i i do feel that there has to be a better coordination between the administration between the uh, urban Mr. Mule, you have not answered my question. I am trying to ask you. I know you are non-political. I am trying to ask you. Uh, the BMC. Not, all of us are political. Let me tell you that. No, no, no. no, no BMC, <laughs> which is the BMC, which is the largest and the richest richest municipal corporation in the world, and the Sipsana, which is presently in the government, has been in the power for the last twenty-five years. Are they slipping, or they are not? Are are are, are, the, are the are the money are being properly utilized? or the simple stripping and taking with the money not doing anything there, there is no denying that governments have failed in managing floods absolutely no denying but the reasons cannot be identified as one or two it you know our urban planning uh, is rather poor the processes of approval are faulty and belong to 18th and 19th century we are not considering how uh, you know uh, th- there is something called sustainable cities we have really crossed all those limits long time back we are allowing uh, i i am not against restrictions putting i restric- am not in favor of putting restrictions but i am certainly uh, in favor of more building more human communities okay. and i have uh, we have 43 second to go can i uh, request dipak ji to if you could come and uh, throw some light about what mulaji has told now last one so, point um, i want I, to, i want to just add if you allow me and therefore i have started something called movement of positivity which can and bring more synergy and it can bring more you know convergence among rural urban societies and organizations of all hues thank you i leave it there please. very good yes dipak ji if you could have 10 second please I, i couldn't agree more you know i mean this is this requires a new type of politics from grassroots upwards and i think that's what we are going to see in the coming decade well, that, no, we, are, we are keeping to a close it has been a fantastic discussion thank you all of us for joining the show and thank you very much 
Thank you everybody. I think I failed to hear hear your but let's connect through email and I would like to seek your guidance for my own work. You know where where I'm really currently engaged. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Mule is seeking your guidance. Mr. Mule is seeking your guidance. Certainly. Yeah, sure. We'll be delighted to collaborate. Just let me know. You have the emails, so let's connect over email. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will connect with all of you. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Josi. Thank you, Deepak ji. Thank you, Mr. Mule. Thank you, Salomi. And it has been a wonderful discussion and privilege to have been the show. Let's see how we can meet next time and debate on the same issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Let's have Thank a you. discussion right. then a debate. That's yes. Right. Right. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.